It's really good to be with you. Um, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, which is, it's a weird thing for me to say, because before that, I lived in Phoenix for uh, 18 years. And before that, I lived in Canada for 20 years. So I still don't feel like I fully live in the South. Um, and I'm pretty glad God moved me out of the desert, though. Can I just say that? I miss all the people. There's some incredible people in Phoenix. But gosh, it's hot. It's ridiculously hot. Like, it's, it's stupid hot. And the thing about Phoenix, like a buddy of mine said it once, he said, the thing about Phoenix is that you walk out of your house in the morning and there's like a dude standing there with a, with a hair dryer. And he's just like, just blowing it in your face. And then you run out to your car and you're driving and the whole time he's like running alongside you with a hair dryer in your face. And then you get out and he's like right there. And it's just crazy. But I'm grateful for the desert because you know, the desert's used a lot in the Bible. Jesus talks a lot about you know, he went into the desert for 40 days to symbolize 40 years of Israel wandering around. A lot of amazing things happen in the desert. A lot of dangerous things happen in the desert. What do you think is the most important thing that you need in the desert? Very good students. Star for the day. You need water. And it's not just in the desert. You just really need water in life. Uh, I thought I knew that, Newfoundland, where I grew up, it's like an island surrounded by the ocean. So you would think growing up, next, thank you, Brent. Can everyone say hi, Brent? Hi. He's awesome, give him a round of applause. Just, I can't, I can't, like, if he's there, I gotta acknowledge him, you know what I mean? It feels weird, it's just, anyways. Um, I grew up on an island surrounded by water, so you'd think that I would know how important water is, but I didn't really get it until I moved to the desert where you just have a finite amount. And then I was like, oh, it's really important. Your body is like 80% water. I don't know if you knew that. It's like the molecules make it up. It's like 65% oxygen, and then there's like percentage of hydrogen. Those two hydrogen and oxygen make water, and the rest is carbon. But it's like 20% uh, dirt, carbon, dust. But 80% of you is water. And the thing about it is that you need water to replenish the water that your body uses because your body uses water for everything. Your body uses water to get rid of the stuff that you have to, and I know that because I've changed a lot of diapers. <laughs> Speaking of which, you want to meet my family really quick? So this is my family, and um, yeah, there they are. So that's my wife, Kristen. And then on the left is Connor, my oldest son. And this up top is Rowan. And then in the middle, that's our newest. He's Callum. He's almost five months old. So, yeah. This is a picture of Callum. Uh, a week ago, he got baptized. Yeah. So, that, there, that picture is showing you how important water is right there. So, and I'm so glad he didn't pee on me when I was holding him. Okay, and this is another picture of Callum, too, just so you can see how cute he is, because he's great. He also looks like me. He's the first one of our kids to kind of look like... The other two, I feel like I just helped determine the sex and the eye color. That's, I felt like, all I did. But this one, I was like, oh, wow, he actually looks like me. But then, this is Connor, and he's kind of as goofy as I am. He's a real, he's a real lover, man, that, that kid. He loves uh, Legos a lot and Star Wars. <laughs> Yep, he's very, very tender-hearted. He's the one that, if he does something bad, he cries. Like one time he broke an animatronic Yoda that somebody had given him and I, and I was trying to punish him, and I was trying to take away his toys. He's like, absolutely, you should take away my toys. And I'm like, wait, this is not how it was supposed to work. <laughs> and then finally, he got upset when, when, when my wife, Kristen, said, Connor, we're so disappointed in you. And he just was like, waterworks. And he's like, mom, I just don't understand my own heart. That's what he said, four years old. Anyways, kids these days, I tell you. The next, this is Rowan. And yeah, don't let her, like her goofy exterior uh, fool you. Her name means fiery red one. And I've learned God honors the name of your child. So don't name your kid fiery red one. Name your kid plays well with others or is not a biter. That's what you should name your kid. Not fiery red one. 
Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's it. They're awesome. So they're great. And they, they show me a lot. They reveal to me a lot. And they drink a lot of water. The funny thing about my kids is that when they're thirsty, they just tell me. They're just like, I gotta get a drink. And I was like, okay, we'll go get a drink. There's no games. And they're, the thing about kids is they're just really honest. It's amazing how in life sometimes we can avoid just getting to the core of what drives us, what motivates us. A couple of years ago, I got to sing at NCYC and it was an amazing thing, and it was like a Friday night, and there's like, we want you to give a keynote. And I was like, crazy, you're gonna let a musician talk. I'm like, this is, they're silly. They have no idea what they're, it's like Chris Padgett, you know, that guy's a lunatic. Who else would wear a Tiger t-shirt? I love him, he's a delicious individual, as he would say. So I get asked to sing at NCYC, and we're on a tour bus, we drive around on a tour bus, and then for, I go to bed, I'm trying to take care of myself, I wake up, and I have like this cold. And I'm all congested. And the thing is, when you sing, you, you're, you kind of need your voice to kind of operate normally at all time. And most of us, we don't think about that. So I'd, this guy once told me, he's like, yeah, if you're ever really like phlegmy or whatever, because if you sing when you're phlegmy, it always sounds like there's something like trying to escape your throat. It's really disgusting. He's like, take a Mucinex. I was like, a Musa what? He's like, take a Mucinex. It'll, it'll, it'll dry out. So I, like, I, go, I wake up. I walk to a Walgreens, I get a package of Mucinex. And the whole day I'm like going, I don't know if I should take this because it says decongestant. That is a fancy word, ladies and gentlemen, that basically what it means is evaporates all the water out of your body. You will become a giant prune. <laughs> Which is not a good thing if you want to sing. So I took it an hour before I was going to start singing. And I'm in a stadium full of 26,000 people and halfway through the second song, all the water evaporated from my body. I'm pretty sure I looked like George Burns, who's an old actor. Like, I was just like, and I already have white hair to begin with, so people were like, wait, is he young? Oh no, he's really old. It was bad, and I couldn't sing. And it was, I was like trying to sing Here I Am, Lord, you know, and it was like, uh, Here I am, Lord. It's like I had a tracheotomy, you know what I mean? I might as well, Here I, it was, it was horrible. It's horrible. I can make that joke, I smoked for 12 years. And I've been quit for over 10, praise God. So, it was so embarrassing, I felt so bad and I got done, I got done uh, singing and talking and I'm sure the whole time I talked, I sounded like somebody who had eaten a bag of gravel. You know, and I'm like trying, Jesus loves you so much. I sounded like, like Marge Simpson's sisters. Hello, Homer. <laughs> Glory to God. It's terrible, but I learned a valuable lesson from that. I went and met with a vocal coach, and she's like, your body's 80% water, and the only things that you can do for your body are sleep and drink a lot of water. She goes, do you know when you're thirsty, it's already too late? I'm like, what do you mean it's already too late? <laughs> like, am I gonna just explode? You know, it's, it's a pile of white dust. Here goes Matt Marr. No, she's like, when you're thirsty, your body's already been deprived of water. That's actually, thirst is a symptom. So you're supposed to like regularly maintain by drinking water. You're supposed to drink half your body weight in ounces every day of water. That's crazy. And if you don't drink water, if you don't quench your thirst, eventually it'll shut you down. The dumbest thing in the world would be like, if you're really thirsty, you drink seawater. How many people watched Bear Grylls before? Yeah, that guy's, hey, everything's crazy. We're here in the wild. And I, I can't do his voice. Anyways, I sounded like an Englishman. He's Australian. They're all the same. I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. Hashtag America. Um, what am I talking about? I'm from Canada. It's... Anyways, the point is, is that when you're thirsty, there's only a handful of things that can actually help you. There's only a few places that you can go to 
to quench your thirst. And if you go to other things, they'll actually damage you. A lot of athletes in here know this. You know, if you drink, if you're working out and you drink a soda, that's like really bad. It's really bad for you. It'll die. It's got caffeine in it. It's got a ton of sugar in it. It's just, the sugar might give you a high per second, but it's just bad. It's just horrible. You're probably going to throw it up later. It's going to be disgusting. Right in front of everybody, right in the middle of the gym, and you'll be mocked for the rest of your life. You don't want that, so don't drink Coke while you're working out. Thank you. Public service announcement. Yeah. The thing is, thirst is very natural. And I'm not just talking about thirsting for water. I'm talking about thirsting for a lot of different things. Food, uh, sleep. My wife gets really hangry if she doesn't get enough sleep. She needs quality sleep, which is really hard with a four-month-old, or just to be fed on a regular basis. So I, may, I force her to carry a granola bar around because if she starts crashing, it's really bad. I, 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 I'll jump out of a moving car if, if I'm in a car with her. It's, it's not fun. Yeah, I'm sorry, ma'am. What did you say? Oh, yeah, you'll learn me a Snickers. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Although I'm lactose intolerant, so I don't think it's a good idea for me to eat a Snickers. It'd be bad. Um, the thing is, is, creature comforts in life, food, sleep, um, those kind of necessities. What's cool about it is that God designed it in a way to remind us of a deeper thirst. That's why sometimes you eat a great meal and you're really, really satisfied. There's a sense of peace and contentment. And what I've learned in my life is it's in those moments, and it's not just food, it's in friendships and relationships. You have moments like we just had an amazing 4th of July party and we had a water slide and my kids were playing all day and I got to go down with this water slide with my son and I at the same time and like we crashed into each other and it was awesome. It was great. He was laughing, I was laughing. It was just this, this sense of contentment. And in that is this reminder from God that he desires that all of our thirsts be quenched. I don't know if you ever thought about that before. A lot of us, we have deep down desires, very natural desires, and God, he actually, he wants those desires met. They're, they're naturally good things. The desire for friendship, the desire for affection, the desire to be noticed, like Chris was talking about earlier, the desire to be esteemed, the desire to be praised. You know, when you're a kid, just, you think about this. I heard this once from a buddy of mine. I spent so much time on the road, I was really nervous about being away from my kids because they're so young. And I'm like, I don't, I'm like so afraid I'm going to give my kids issues. <laughs> like, they don't come with manuals, people. You know what I mean? It'd be really easy if just they were born, if there was just like a, like a tattoo and it dissolved after the first 30 days. It was like, here's what you do. But we don't come with those. And so my wife and I, we always praying every day. We're like, God, please help us be good parents. Please help us be good parents. But in that very natural desire, in that very natural thirst, is also a realization that I can't, I can't meet all of their needs. I can't meet all of them. There's no way. It's not possible. And so I'm going to fall short as a parent. I have, to, I have to kind of live with that. So these deeper desires of like me wanting to hear God say, like, you can do it. You have what it takes. That's a deeper desire. So kids, the crazy thing about kids is they don't remember how much time you spend with them. They remember how you make them feel. And I think the same is probably the same with everyone in this room and God. Is that a lot of us, we think about spending time with God as this thing that, and holiness is this idea that we have to spend massive amounts of time with God. God's not, he'd love it. But if, you, if you're not there, it's okay. Because God wants you to walk away knowing how much you're loved and how much he desires you. Some of you have friends and you have desire for friendships. Some of you are dating people. You have a desire to be, a, to be esteemed, to be told you're pretty. And, and that's a natural desire, but it, it can fall very quickly and become disordered. Where all of a sudden you're willing to make sacrifices because you need that thirst 
met now. You need it met in the moment. And the funny thing is, that, that immediate sense of fulfillment, guess what? It's not going to satisfy you because you're not getting to the deeper what's really, really at the core. You're not getting down below the surface. There's a story in the Bible, and it illustrates the permanence of God's love for you. See, there's a lot of things that can temporarily satisfy your thirst. Sure, popularity, that can temporarily satisfy your thirst. Money, yeah, it's great. Who wouldn't want a ton of money? But guess what? That doesn't satisfy the thirst. Like, why is it, if money was that such a great thing, why are there so many miserable rich people? Tell me. Why is it you turn on, like we have a whole industry devoted to just stalking people who are rich and who are famous and who are wealthy. And if that stuff was so good, why are they such a mess? And it's not even a judgment because they'd be the first ones to say it. I mean, who wants to inherit the world and you get out of your car every day and there's like 50 strangers with cameras following you and they record everything about you? That sounds, that sounds miserable to me. Why would I ever want that? And yeah, some of us do. I talk to so many young people and they, they come up to me after concerts and I'm like, what do you, they're like, hey, I have a question. I'm like, sure, uh, what is it? They're like, how do I get to be famous? And I'm like, what? And they're like, well, I, I wanna do what you do. And I'm like, so what do I do? And they're like, I don't know, but you're famous. And I was like, listen, dude, fame is relative. Because I can tell you what, I can walk down the street in Des Moines, Iowa, and there's a 75-year-old lady who has no idea who I am, and she's probably going to think I'm her age. <laughs> Fame is relative. Fame is fleeting. The things of the world, sure, they're great. Sure, they, they, they can sometimes satisfy you temporarily, but they're not permanent. They'll fade. Just like the water that you have to keep drinking. You have to keep drinking it. Because without it, you'll die. And that's what happens with the things of the world. I know a lot of us, we come to conferences like this and we want to change. We want to, you know, we hear inspiring talk or, or you, you, like, you, you have an amazing encounter with God in a guy session or a girl session or, you know, the, the, the mass is this like amazing experience. You're like, I wish I could go to mass every weekend in an arena. This is awesome. You know, and I'm with all these other young people and we're singing and I go to my church and there's like a dude behind me and he's tone deaf and he sounds terrible. I wish I could do this. And like some of you are gonna have those kind of inspiring moments. But you're gonna still walk away and you're gonna go, I don't know how to change. Some of you have desires and thirst that have slowly disformed into addictions, into massive insecurities and you're isolated from everybody around you. You've created a false sense of who you are. And who you are on Snapchat and who you are on Instagram, that's not really who you are. And everybody looks great from this angle. <laughs> you can hide all your chin fat. I'm 41, I got chin fat, look. And it's probably because I'm looking at my phone too much, by the way. That's a scientific thing. It's a drag. I wish it wasn't true. Then I try holding my phone up and doing this, and that just feels weird. <laughs> then I feel old. If I do that, then I just feel like an old person. They're like, look at that guy. He's definitely old. He's holding his phone like a weirdo. <laughs> I want to read you a scripture. Uh, a story, like I said, there's a story in the Bible, and I think it, it is very appropriate for what we're talking about. This is just a quote from Jesus. It was in that video, and I want to give a, just a little bit of context. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. First of all, that's a weird phrase, living water. Like, what does that exactly mean? There was like a sci-fi movie called The Abyss in the 90s. There was this weird tube of water. Like, I don't, like if you're a Samaritan woman and someone talks to you about living water, first of all, water is life. So this must be like super special water. 
But you're going to hear about, about this more uh, through the weekend. But it was at noon that Jesus was at a well waiting to be a woman who's going to noon. See, as somebody who lived in Arizona, you don't go to a well at noon. You get up at five in the morning and start walking. Because that's what all the other women did. The reason this woman was going at noon, and you'll hear about the story, is because she's been married seven times and she's been ostracized by what she's done. She's been alienated. She's going to a well at noon because she doesn't want to meet God. Because she thinks God doesn't love her. But God's there waiting for her. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is waiting for you in the middle of your thirst. He is waiting for you in the middle of your desires, waiting to be discovered. And Jesus says to this woman, give me a drink. Jesus says to you, give me a drink. And you're like, a drink of what? He's like, of you. See, this is the crazy thing. God is thirsty for you. God thirsts for your thirst. He thirsts to quench your thirst. There's that stupid Sprite campaign, Obey Your Thirst. I always feel like, I mean, that's a ridiculous thing. I've obeyed my thirst before and it's got me in terrible trouble. Terrible trouble. What you should do is you should listen to your thirst. You should pay attention to your thirst. That's important. It's your, your life and your soul is trying to say something to you about life. And if you're dissatisfied with life, if you can slow down and shut down and shut off long enough to get in touch with the fact that you're thirsty. It's in that dissatisfaction that Jesus is waiting. He's just waiting to give you an invitation. So I want to share this song I wrote with a friend of mine. And, and it is this, it's this open invitation from Jesus. Jesus doesn't say, come as you should be. Jesus doesn't say, come as you think you should be. Or come as you wish you were. Jesus says, come as you are. Come as you are. My guess is we're all thirsty. 